רבי שמעון. The Gemara in Pesachim says that any time it says the Rabbi Shimon, it's referring to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Now why is this so important? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was one of the Tanaim. He was also one of the major students of Rabbi Akiva. But Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, is loved by everyone, especially secular people. You say Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, School of Mitzvot. If you say Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai to most Sephardic women of previous generation, right away, Rabbi Meir Baranes kissed the mezuzah 500 times. They get excited, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Meir, they have candles. The whole teaching of the Zohar, where does it come from? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Chassidut, when they do all the things that, let's say, for example, the Baal Shem Tov, the Ari, all of the Ari was against it. But nonetheless, the point is that when people talk about different secret parts of the Torah, where do they get it from? Rabbi Shimon. People get excited about Rabbi Shimon. Why do they get so excited? Rabbi Shimon gave us some reasons to party. He gave us Lag Baumel. Everybody knows Lag Baumel. What do you do, like Baumel? In Israel you do it. I don't know, in America you don't do anything, unfortunately, because you get arrested. You make a bonfire in Israel. I remember as a kid, you make the bonfire in the backyard or sometimes somewhere in the uh, big place over there. Everybody gathers wood the whole week. You throw some batatos, some uh, potatoes. You party all night. The kids, the adults, no one worries about what's going to happen tomorrow, if there's school, there's no school, nothing like that. You party all night, you eat, you drink. So this is perfect for the chilonim, for the secular people. Wow. Everybody wants to be religious that day. Everybody keeps that holiday. Some of them are even machmirim. They do it all year round. Every time they go to Tveria, every time they go to the beach, they always want to do a bonfire. Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon. Seder. So Rabbi Shimon, according to some people, gave us a reason to party. He also gave us a lot of secrets that a lot of people like. Some people don't keep Shabbat, don't keep Tarat Mishpacha, don't keep kosher even. Nothing. We tell Rabbi Shimon, they'll listen to you. Oh, Rabbi Shimon, it's the Zohar. Yeah, what do you say in the Zohar? They like to hear stories in the Zohar. There's a lot of mystical things about angels, about Shedim. People are very interested in mystical stuff, even if they're not religious at all. So people love Rabbi Shimon has all the mystical stuff, Rabbi Shimon signed off on it. That's what people think. So you read the whole Gemara. You see that mystical was day to day by everybody. But anyway, everyone knows this mystical book of the Zohar that most people don't even know how to read. But they think that this is something that's uh, because it's less accessible, because it's less understood, that's what they want. The basics, the most important, Five books of Moses, Gemara, Mishnah, Shulchan Aruch. No, no, it's not interesting. That's for Haredim. That's for the really uh, religious people. I want the mystical stuff. Yeshout, you know, they want to go directly to the secret. No one wants to know the stuff, the, the pshat. Everyone wants to go to the secret. Okay, fine. So if we're respecting and honoring Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, let's see what he says. So Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says the following. He says... If three people have eaten at the same table, just like Baomer, you're going to have a table. You're not going to eat on the floor. You're going to have a table, I'm assuming, or hopefully. On a day-to-day -day basis, you're going to have a table. You're going to eat. Or even if you don't have a table. Three people eating together. And they don't speak Tivre Torah. It's as if they've eaten the offering of an idol. Now, Rabbi Shimon seems like he's a little bit of kitsoni here. Seems a little extreme. Okay, I understand. I like the party part. I like the Lag Baomer. I like the mystical stuff. But Rabbi Shimon, relax already with this idol worship just because I don't speak Torah. Maybe I don't know anything. So how did Rabbi Shimon become who he is? If you look at the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, page uh, 33, I believe, and um, 
it says that after Rabbi Shimon found out that the Romans were making Jewish people's lives more difficult, he didn't hold his opinion. He's not like today's politically correct rabbis. He said, no, no, listen. Say you like Trump. Say you like uh, Hillary Clinton. Say you like uh, Obama and Osama. Say you like whoever because it's good for the Jews. It's good for the Jews. What do you mean it's good for the Jews? Obama wanted to kill every Jew in the world. He just didn't have the permission. What are you talking about? No, no, but it's not good. It's not good. Just befriend him. No, no, my friend. Maybe Shimon said, you're going against Torah? You're an enemy of Hashem. You're an enemy of Hashem. You're an enemy of mine. And he publicizes his, his opinion. No worries at all. But he obviously wasn't a fool. He realized that they're going to hate him. They're going to want to kill him. So he ran away. So him and his son, Rabbi Lazal, ran into the mountains and hid in a cave for 13 years. All they had with them was Torah. One set of clothes that they put on that they wore there. The tree in the front that uh, grew carobs, which if you eat carobs even for like one time, all your teeth would break. And it was right next to a river. So they drank the water of the river. They ate the carobs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner without complaints. And the clothing, they only wore on Shabbat. What did they wear the rest of the week? Nothing. They dug themselves a hole in the ground. They went into the ground. They covered themselves in sand so they could learn Torah. Because you can't learn Torah when you're uh, naked. So they covered themselves with sand. Why do they do this? Because they said, listen, we have to have clothing. It's in honor of Shabbat. You can't show up to Shabbat with ripped clothing. Shem you got to look honorable. The queen's coming. We're well, going to go with the uh, ripped clothing, ripped jeans to see the queen. Not Peter. So they said, listen, the whole week, we're going to uh, stay inside the hole and make sure that our clothing doesn't get ruined. And that's what they did for 13 years. Their dedication to Torah was to such an extent that Chazal says that when they came out, they saw regular average Torah observant farmers there weren't chilunim back then. There weren't really many people that uh, violated Shabbat in the open because anyone that violated Shabbat would get killed. There was still a Sanhedrin. So they saw Torah observant Jews working in a farm. You know, you work, you learn. Normal. Al violino. They saw them and they said, how could they waste any time in this mundane world? How could they spend any time not learning Torah. They couldn't understand how somebody that knows that the Torah exists and spends any time at all doing anything else. They just came out of a cave with 24 hours a day. They were learning Torah. They got to such a high level of kedusha, learning from the angels, learning things that are beyond our comprehension, that they connected and they became completely, like, fully holy. They sanctified their own bodies, their own flesh, to such an extent that when they saw these people just living their life, they were keeping Shabbat, they were keeping kosher, they were keeping Talat Mishpachat, they were observant people, not bad people. They couldn't understand them dealing with the world the way they were, and their Kedusha created a fire that was starting to burn the people. Until Hashem... Moments later came out and from Shammai, a, a, a bat call, a heavenly voice came out from Shammai and said, did you come out of the cave to destroy my world? Go back inside. And he sent them back inside. And during the next year, he lowered them. He intentionally lowered their level of Kedusha because he knew that the high level that they got to, both of them, Rabbi Elazar and his father, Rabbi Shimon, was too much for this world. The same goes, by the way, for Eliyahu Navi. We mentioned Eliyahu Navi earlier today. In the, uh, the book of uh, Malachi, says that um, one, what's going to be one of the big signs that the Mashiach is here? The sign's going to be, there's not going to be a secret. Everyone's going to know it. What's the first thing? Aside from the war, because there's a lot of wars. Aside from bad government, there's always been bad government. Aside from promiscuity, unfortunately, it's become a norm already over the last generation. 
What's the what's the big sign? Eliyahu and Navi is going to show up. Eliyahu and Navi is going to show up. Hashem says, "I'm going to send Eliyahu and Navi for that to prepare everyone for the big awesome day, the day of Hashem. Three days before Mashiach comes. So Eliyahu and Navi is going to do the breaking news. Breaking news." CNN, Fox, everybody at the same time, they're going to have a picture of some guy wearing what looks like Arab clothes to us today because we all wear black and white or pink or gray or this. He's this holy man. Practically, you see fire around him from the Kedusha. But he has a, probably a uh, turban on his head. He has something that uh, looks like what the Arabs look like today. And you see he's breaking news to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, time has run out. Mashiach will arrive in three days. No more excuses, no more chance to convert, no more chance to do tshuva. What you are is what you are. The three days to prepare the people that were like 50-50. Meaning he was keeping Shabbat, he was keeping the foundational mitzvot. Keeping Shabbat. Keeping Talat Mishpacha, keeping kosher, learning Torah every day. But still, he liked money too much. He's still living for this world. He was still preparing for the day he was going to build his $10 million house. He was still really, really looking forward for the Mashiach not to come. Be tuned with me. Nobody sees. You really want the Mashiach to come? It's not going to, you're not going to have $10 million houses to look at all day. You're not going to have promiscuity. You're not going to have... Women running around naked. You're not going to have all the gambling, the cheating, the corruption, the gall nefesh that we call normal today. You're not going to have that anymore. The truth is, most people don't want the Mashiach to come. Including from people. Including religious people. Why? They're enjoying this world. Especially if they live in America. You tell a guy, Mashiach's going to come. No, what do you mean Mashiach's going to come? I'm doing a $500,000 extension to my house. What Mashiach? Tell them to come next year. Let me at least enjoy the house for another year. I just signed a contract with AT&T. They're going to pay me $1.5 million over the next few years. Where's Mashiach? Let me enjoy the money a little bit. I just bought a McLaren. I just bought a Ferrari. I just bought a Mercedes. I'm going to enjoy the cold. Mashiach is here. I just got married. I just this. I just... Everybody's living for this world. Nobody wants the Mashiach to come. Nobody wants to. In reality... Most people don't want the Mashiach to come. They're enjoying this world. Who wants the Mashiach to come? People that are struggling. People that have sickness, Hashem Yachem. People that have no money. People that are struggling financially. Marriage. Kids. People that are struggling. They want Mashiach to come. Why? Because they figure, listen. I struggled. Mashiach is going to save me. But it's not, he's not going to save you by default. He's not just because you struggled, everything's going to be okay. You also have to comply with the other part, which means that you have to fulfill what Hashem said. So what does everybody have to do? You have to open a Torah. What does Hashem say about this? Okay, this is what He says. What am I doing? Okay, I'm not doing this. i got to fix that. Okay, Hashem says, I have to eat kosher. Inside the house and outside the house. Okay, I'm not doing that. I'm only doing inside the house, so I guess it's a problem. Okay. Uh, Hashem says, late feeling six times a week. Uh, I'm doing three, four on a good week. That's a little bit of a problem. Okay, so i got to fix that. Oh, I can't get angry so quickly. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a problem because um, anger is the only thing I know. So you start looking at the book, and you start looking at the mirror, and you start realizing you have a problem. Mashiach is not going to help you if you arrive today. Because you're not ready. So for all of those that want Mashiach to come, the best thing you can do for yourself is prepare for him to come. For all of those who don't want him to come because you're enjoying this world, you have a bigger problem. Because you're Bechlan not ready. You don't even have the schut of suffering. At least the one that suffered has some schuyot and shamayim. has some kaparat avonot. You enjoy this world so much, you got the house, you got the car, you got the girl, you got the guy, you got the kids, you got this, you got, you got everything. 
you're joining this world so much, but you're not exactly keeping all of the mitzvot, you're not exactly looking at the Sefer Torah and comparing your life to what it says, you have a bigger problem. You have a bigger problem, even if you wear a hat, even if you have a long beard. If you're enjoying this world so much that you're actually a must, you're living for this world, you're not ready. You're not ready. This is what we have Musar lessons for. Because Musar is the only thing that's going to purify you. Just like Hashem says to the Prophet Zechariah, after the first bomb that wipes out two-thirds of the world, Shem Elachem, says it in the book of Zechariah. I didn't say it. He said it. You have a complaint? Go to Hashem. First bomb, two-thirds of the world, Hashem Elachem is gone. But there's still going to be a third left. Hashem says, the last third, I'm going to burn them like, to, like purifying silver. Not kill them, but meaning, it's not going to be exactly peaches for them. The remaining third. They shouldn't be celebrating yet. You still have to be purified the last part. Now, if we start purifying ourselves today, so, okay, you know what, this stuff is scary. Let me stop with the non-Jewish girlfriend. This stuff is scary. Let me stop with the goy boyfriend. Stuff is scary. Let me stop stealing. Let me stop. Let me start seeing what it says in the books. Start working on my character traits. Stop caring what everyone else thinks. And if anything, start feeling bad for them. Because if they're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, they're probably part of the two thirds. If they're spending most of the day looking at cars because they're excited about buying the next car, they're probably part of the two-thirds. If they're excited about, I don't know, building houses and buildings and everything else, they're probably part of the two-thirds. Not definitely, but part, probably. Not that I'm a judge or a jury, but like I said, the reality of it is that Mashiach is not coming here to fulfill your uh, financial dreams. And the Yawanav is going to show up and he's going to tell us, clock's out, but you have three days. Three days to do, it's like the last five yards. Whatever you are right now, go for it. The people that are 50 50, you kept all the foundational mitzvot, but you still enjoy this world a little too much, right now is the time you have to choose. And according to the sages, some of these fools will choose. The wrong decision. Instead of choosing to fulfill the will of Hashem, they're going to choose to fight the Mashiach. They're going to choose to go to war with him. And their name is Erev Rav. So, the big thing here is that we see Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai comes out of a cave, doesn't understand how people are spending any time whatsoever in this world, Hashem says, okay, it's too much. Go to the cave. Hashem did the same exact thing to Eliyahu and Avi. Eliyahu and Avi, Chazal says he's also Pinchas. Parashat Pinchas, the same one that put the spear into Zimri and Cosby, the, the Jewish leader in the Goya, when they're cohabiting. Pinchas couldn't deal with this. He saw... Such Chilul Hashem took a spear, killed him in front of everyone. Chazal says Pinchas, that got blessed by Hashem, made him a Kohen Gadol, gave him a special blessing that's beyond our understanding of how significant he was. Chazal says he's Eliyahu Navi. Some say he was the Gilgul, meaning Pinchas eventually died and then became Eliyahu Navi, came back as a reincarnation as Eliyahu Navi. Some say he just eventually changed his name to Eliyahu the Prophet. Elijah the Prophet, Eliyahu Navi. Either way, Eliyahu Navi got to such a high level of Kedusha that if you look at the end, when he was walking with his student Elisha, Elisha the Prophet, he says, okay, I have to go now. I have to go to Hashem. Hashem's calling me. What do you mean Hashem's calling you? Hashem is always calling, you're a prophet. No, 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 no. Time to go. Time to leave this world. Elisha started crying and begging him, No, Rabbi, please don't leave me. How is the world going to survive without you? You're the prophet, you're the rebuker, you're telling people the truth. Who else is going to do it? You're going to do it. 
No, 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 I can't do it, I can't do it. Mamash cried. He said, I'm not leaving you. Well, you have to leave me. And it got to a point where Hashem had to scare Elisha. He sent a um, carriage with horses of fire to separate them. And then a whirlwind took Eliyahu and Avi to Shemaim. Meaning Eliyahu and Avi didn't die a natural death like a human being, even though he was a human being. So Chazal asked, why didn't Hashem take him? If you want, if he was so amazing, just leave him here. Eliyahu and Avi got to a point where he was too zealous. Too zealous for this world. He says, the world is getting worse and worse. You're getting better and better. You connected to me on such a deep level, you won't survive in this world, meaning you're going to destroy my world. Just like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I didn't give you all this kusha so you could destroy my world. But at the same token, I can't lower you, because that will destroy you. So, come, be one of my angels. I'll bring you back three days before the Mashiach. I've heard enough. New arrival screams. Echoing through the hallway to know that this ain't good. Once they pass them through the infierno, they don't come back. It's enough to make you go crazy. Do not think we fear you, spirit. We know your power is born of evil. This is your last night in the land of the living. You understand me, Malavan Demon? that lived here called the Hetheringtons and unfortunately their daughter passed away of a heart attack inside the house. Basically they were so devastated that they reached out to people claiming to be psychic mediums. They actually weren't psychic mediums. They opened up a total of 11 portals inside this house and invited spirits and entities from all different kinds of dimensions. Well I think there are certain pieces of evidence that there is an afterlife. The resurrection of the dead is affirmed uh, pretty clearly uh, in the Talmud and the Midrash. To be honest with you, to give this lecture is a nightmare. If it was up to me, I wouldn't. There's going to be some graphic details. This place is a maze. The person after death went to a place called Sheol. This is by far the largest near-death experience study that has ever been conducted. People go to a place and they experience weird things. And sometimes they actually will see a character of some type. Well, where did that come from? I don't know why that one chain is swinging back there.
They may describe feeling profoundly peaceful, seeing a bright, warm, welcoming light. Some people describe watching doctors and nurses working on them with incredible accuracy. Next thing I knew, I was above my body watching the operation. How long did you feel like you were gone? I went to a place of timelessness. And so what that means, it could have been a second. It could have been five minutes. I don't know. Can you imagine waking up from your sleep and not being able to move? As I'm lying there, I realized that there's a, an evil presence next to me. Do you believe that angels, demons exist? Holy oh, get out of here! Oh my god, dude! Strange things keep happening. Bizarre nightmares, as if I'm on fire. <gasps> Whoa, what the hell is this? Man, I've got bad chest pain. Satan's Hollow is what it's called, the portal to hell. Some people calling it an eye of fire, while others said it looked like the portal to hell opening up. And the next thing I know, I was outside of my body, looking at my body. What I'm going to do is called claromancy, the art of throwing lots or throwing bones. 2,000 years of experience, passed down, recorded, of how demons work. God has them all on a leash, and he lets the leash go enough to let them tempt us, because that's what makes us spiritually stronger. I'm trying to be as graphic as possible so you understand what we're talking about. It's your ticket to reality. It's your ticket to freedom. It's your ticket to immortality. Is there an afterlife? Is there a this God? It's the type of information that can keep you away from the itself. What happens to us after we die?